Hey everyone, how's it going out there? Garrett Pachtinger, board certified criticalist and co-founder of Vet Girl, along with Justine Lee, emergency critical care and also toxicology. And we're super excited to be at this year's 2017 Hills Global Symposium in DC. What are we learning so far, Garrett? Well, we've been in lectures all day long and let me tell you something, it's been an amazing ride so far. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over a couple of hot tips we learned from each of our lecturers. If you missed it and you're learning something from our tips, you can go online, we'll give you the website. Totally and you free. Can, totally free. And you can watch the recording of today's sessions. But the first tip I wanted to talk about is being that we're both critical care specialists, I found this really interesting. We had a board certified surgeon, Dr. James Giles, who's been out there in the trauma and unfortunately war. We all understand how difficult that is. He gave me something interesting to think about regarding triage. Justine and I always talk about the ABCDs, airway, airway, breathing, circulation, and dysfunction. But he gave me a new sort of tip or, or a little shortcut that they use out there called MARCH. It stands for the M muzzle and massive bleeding because certainly if we're trying to help protect a dog that's injured we don't want to get bitten so if you're worried make sure you protect yourself so muzzle and massive bleeding of the m the a is airway so similar to our abcds yep. there comes airway the r in march is respiration so there comes our b for breathing it's our respiration c in march is circulation that makes sense and finally head and hypothermia but interesting in trauma battlefield they don't use the abcds they use the march mnemonic so a cool new tip i learned today and something that i'll take back with me in the er on my next shift what did you learn when it came to military dogs and passive hypothermia and hypotension interesting because unfortunately being on the battlefield they may not have the same resources we have and the last thing they want if there's a major injury whether it's a bomb or a gunshot or something like that is to control bleeding only to give a massive fluid bolus for example and that clot to be washed away so what they like to do very similar in human medicine is of course they may require fluids but they don't want them in a sense to be hypertensive they want the blood pressures to be around 80 or so just above 60 because we know the important organs the kidneys the brain we want them to be perfused with a doppler or systolic around 60 or greater so we'll try to be about 80 but we try not to have them be 100 120 140 to blow off that clot so some permissive or passive hypotension in the emergency trauma bleeding situation and i think that's really important because both care and i see a lot of chemo abdomen cases from hemangiomas sarcoma. And so while there's a lot of data that's missing in clinical small animal practice, this really applies like to blowing off the clot off of the spleen with internal bleeding. So we still want to buy and resuscitate them, but maybe not as aggressively as we used to think we didn't want it to. Absolutely. And this may help us get them to be what I like to call better optimized. We may never stabilize them. If they're bleeding internally, they may need to have that spleen out, for example. Mm -hmm. But I like to optimize them so they're, they're as stable as they can be before they go under anesthesia for that surgery. So while we are here, we actually also heard from a human MD who was one of the keynote speakers, and he actually talked about what we should do with advanced kidney disease. What do we do with nutritional support? What we found was that the GFR will decrease when there's less than 60% of function. Garrett, what else did we learn? I think one of the interesting things I learned in a case like this, and it was actually sort of a theme throughout the day, is that patients with some of these chronic diseases like chronic kidney disease tend over time because they don't eat well, they don't feel well, they may not eat even the right amount or type of food, they tend to lose muscle mass. We all recognize that sort of cachectic or poor body condition, 16-year-old chronic renal failure cat, and the speaker showed pictures in human medicine as well as you become elderly, you don't eat as well, you lose muscle mass. Well, what studies have actually shown is that the loss of muscle mass actually increases your risk of other disease whether it's pneumonia, other types of infections, and the list goes on. So he really started the day's uh, theory or concept of how important it is for our patients to eat well, to eat the right things, and to have good muscle mass because that alone can be a significant comorbidity for not only human patients, but the patients you and I see. 
What else we learned from this human MD was that a low protein diet is really important because it helps reduce the decline in your glomerular filtration rate, it helps reduce the incidence or the severity of metabolic acidosis, and it improves insulin clearance and glucose tolerance. So it has more effect on the systemic body than we think. And what he really went into in these cases is that it's important for us as clinicians to recognize early that patients can have chronic kidney disease. And that set the theme for the rest of the day. Very often, what you and I deal with is that we see patients when it's a little bit too late, especially in the emergency room or the intensive care unit. They're significantly azotemic. They may have polyuria and polydipsy. So Justine, let's tell our listeners and viewers out there, when I see a patient in the ER and they're polyuric and polydipsic, what portion of their nephrons have they already lost? Well, so that's an interesting question. We've always been taught in veterinary school that usually means that 70% to 75% of the renal function is gone. But now we're learning with the SDMA test from IDEX, this may change everything. So what did we learn from IDEX today? What was really interesting about the SDMA study is that's allowing us to find patients that are early on in the disease process. Because as Justine said, typically when we see azotemia, so when your BUN and creatinine are elevated, that means about 75% of your nephrons are lost. If they're polyuric and polydipsic, about 66 or two thirds of your nephrons are lost. But what the SDMA test does is it allows us to determine which patients are getting early kidney disease well before they should be azotemic and well before they should be polyuric and polydipsic. So we can start treating them much earlier in the disease process to help slow down progression of that disease. We may not be able to completely cure or reverse something, but certainly the goal is to reverse progression of kidney disease. And I think that's really important with what Dr. David Polson talked about today, was we wanna catch kidney disease as early as possible because by the time it's stage three or four, it's irreversible. And so being able to utilize urine specific gravity, SCMA, clinical signs, appropriate history, will hopefully allow us to be able to save some of our patients earlier. Another important thing that I uh, noticed with Dr. Jane Robertson when she talked about was we know that SDMA was available in about 2015 and we just got in in our clinic probably within the past six months. A lot of clinicians don't know how to interpret it. Um, so in general, I know that the IRIS guidelines have been modified. So we start to become concerned when it's greater than 14. So what did we learn today about SDMA and the IRIS staging? Does, what does it affect? So interestingly, what they talked about is, as Justine said, greater than 14 becomes a concern. As of now, between 15 and 19 is kind of that gray zone. We're not quite sure yet what that specifically means. Could it be early kidney disease? Not sure yet. So if it's between 15 and 19, that's the clinician's clue to start looking for reasons that that patient may be sick. Are they azotemic? So you should do a renal panel. We should check a urine sample. Maybe we're doing other diagnostics such as x-rays or ultrasound to see if there's any other evidence of disease. But 15 and 19 is kind of that in-between gray zone where we're gonna investigate, but we're not yet gonna be convinced this kidney disease. Once the value is greater than 20, then we're pretty certain that that patient is going to have kidney disease. Hopefully, we've caught them in stage one and can start some therapies which we went over later on in the day to decrease the likelihood of rapid progression make them comfortable we don't want protein loss as we talked about so the goal is trying to catch them in that early iris stage one which is a challenge for us to do just based on history examination or even BUN or creatinine at this stage and one important tip to remember is again if you're looking at SCMA it's in that 14 15 and 19 range remember IMM investigate manage and monitor. What does that mean? In two to four weeks, you should recheck renal function, you should recheck your SDMA. You, again, like Garrett said, wanna make sure there's not a urinary tract infection that's progressing to a pyelonephritis. Again, we wanna catch this early. Another thing that we learned from Dr. Steinbach was some things that we can do to advance the management of chronic kidney disease patients. One thing that I thought was interesting is using erythropoietin. Instead of using erythropoietin two to three times a week, actually using darbopoietin. And this is a recombinant human erythropoietin analog. It lasts longer when compared to erythropoietin and when dosed between 0.5 and approximately one microgram per kid per week, it actually resulted in a dramatically increased survival from 83 days to 283 days. 
In dogs, 85% of dogs also responded, so also a great option for dogs with anemia with chronic kidney disease. And while there was no difference in survival, it did seem to respond pretty well. I also wanted to point out one thing that I actually thought was really significant from the same speaker, talking about the SDMA as well. And I thought these were really interesting numbers that I grabbed onto. So with the SDMA in dogs, she felt that 9.8 months, so we're approaching a year, before azotemia developed, you would get an abnormality on your SDMA. In cats, 17 months, so we're talking almost about a year and a half before they became azotemic, you would get an abnormality on your SDMA. So an interesting topic to consider for your patients to again, try to get them in iris stage one before they become azotemic, before they become sick, so we can intervene. One of the nutritionists spoke here, Dr. Witzel, and one thing that she talked about is when do we actually start to recommend a low protein diet? This one is near and dear to my heart because I have a 19 year old cat who of course has chronic renal insufficiency. Thankfully this cat has been stage one for a while, but I started restricting my cat pretty early, several years ago, and now my cat is hectic and emaciated. So the big question is when do we decide to actually reach for that low protein diet? And her recommendation is we want to protein restrict and start that when they're non-azotemic but when they're proteinuric, or if there are azotemic patients. So whenever there's presence of proteinuria seems to be the big factor of when we're gonna go ahead and restrict that protein. The next person I wanted to talk about was Dr. Susan Little. Dr. Susan Little talked about two important things today. One is anti-emetic therapy, and the other was that proton pump inhibitor, H2 blocker, acid-reducing medication, because with the uremia and acids that build up in kidney disease, we worry that a lot of the nausea and vomiting may be related to that. First point that I wanted to make was that cats don't really have significant evidence of uremic gastritis. When they looked at their stomachs histopathologically, it was more evidence of actually fibrosis. And mineralization. And mineralization. So I guess the question is, are we missing the early signs and that's chronicity? It's hard to know. But the two drugs that I wanted to point out, which she felt like were the most effective for these patients, as far as the acid reducing drugs, if you think that's gonna help your patient, Omeprazole, a proton pump inhibitor, is gonna be better than, for example, famotidine, an H2 blocker. Probably one milligram per kilogram, at least twice daily, would be what I would start with. Yeah, and I think the important mistake that a lot of veterinarians are making is they use famotidine quite often, and they think it's an anti-emetic, but really it has no anti-emetic property. We've known for a long time that proton pump inhibitors are more effective, and it's really important if your owner is really struggling to medicate their cat, I don't know if it'd be the first thing that I reach for, especially with this data showing lack of you know, gastric ulcers or lack of uremic gastritis. So again, if an owner is really struggling to medicate a cat, I honestly would personally move away from uh, using that type of antacid. Absolutely. Now regarding anti-emetics, there were three she discussed today. Meropidant, Ondansetron, and Dilazitron. And the takeaway that I took from her is that meropidant is going to be likely the most effective one we have for our feline patients. It did decrease the chronic vomiting. It may not have increased their appetite, but certainly did decrease their vomiting. The other important points I wanted to make were both ondansetron and dilazitron acted with a much shorter duration of action than we may expect. So on Dancitron, for example, you may need to give at least three times a day to have any effect on our feline patients. And Dilazitron, well I thought it was probably a once a day medication, should be given probably at least twice because when they took blood samples and levels, it was gone at the 12 hour mark. So the other thing I did want to talk with Dr. Susan Little mentioned is other side effects of chronic kidney disease and electrolyte abnormalities. And one that hopefully you are familiar with is hypokalemia, or a low potassium level. And somewhere around 20 to maybe 30% of our feline patients may be hypokalemic. And we're all thinking, well, you know, if they don't have ventral flexion of the neck and severe weakness, they must not have hypokalemia. But Dr. Susan Little mentioned there are a couple more subtle signs that you shouldn't miss on your patients. Now, they can just be generally lethargic, they may have a decreased appetite, but one thing that she picked up on and commented on was constipation. That she liked to have owners give a fecal score. And I don't know that many owners love to do this, but certainly if the patient has very firm, very hard, very brittle 
feces, that may be a sign of hypokalemia and poor fluid balance to be checked. But one thing I learned, and this was especially important with my own cat, was depending on how much canned food we're feeding, we may not be meeting the resting energy requirements of that patient. So that was shocking because, you know, I'm always weighing my own cat once a month just to make sure he's not losing weight, but that was a big take home for me. I have to admit, as a criticalist, and maybe you would agree, I don't do a lot of supplementation with minerals or vitamins or other things, but one important factor that we talked about today, and Dr. Dana Hutchinson started with this, but several other speakers also mentioned this, was the importance of carnitine in diets. I'm not going to bore you with pathophysiology, but very simply what carnitine allows is for the fatty acids from fat to be used as an energy source. And if you have a carnitine deficiency, which you can actually see because carnitine is released via the kidneys, you pee it out, essentially. If you have a patient that is polyuric, polydipsic, and peeing out carnitine, you can lose it there. If they have lack of intake, they're not eating well, you can lose it there. And guess what happens if you don't have carnitine? You can't use those fatty acids. You can't use the fat as an energy source. As a result, what happens? What do they use for an energy source? Protein the amino acids from protein, and that can actually make them more muscle wasted and more cachectic. And so while we're talking a lot about protein, it's not just the protein that they eat, it's the utilization of protein and the utilization of fat. So if you have a carnitine deficiency, that can be a reason as to why they are losing weight, losing muscle mass, and becoming cachectic. So making sure that we supplement carnitine if needed to give them a good energy source from their fat and to spare their protein and muscle. It's good to hear that KD, the new formulated KD had over 150% of the requirements for carnitine. So really important information, especially since it does increase lean body mass. Yeah, another good point that Dr. Quimby brought up, who's an internist from Ohio State, she talked about appetite stimulants. And I use mercazepine. What I found was interesting was that she had found that the dose of 3.75 or a quarter of a 15 minute tablet should potentially be used once a day instead of every 72 hours, every three days in normal healthy patients. However, in those patients with renal disease, they should be using it less often because of metabolism. And there is a new appetite stimulant they had coming out and it's gonna affect the factor ghrelin and the new drug is called Entice. Come on, tell, tell them how to pronounce it. I'm gonna call it Capromorelin. Now that may or may not be right, so we'll just say entice. Yes. This is one of the new promising drugs out there, especially in our canine patients from what we understand so far, that's really going to be a great tool that we have to entice pets to eat. The last thing I wanted to leave us with was really important to me because my 19 year old cat also has severe osteoarthritis. He has been arthritic, he's been on gabapetin, um, I've done acupuncture with him, and so it was actually really neat for me to see that KD now comes with mobility. And the main reason why is because a recent statistic found that over 60% of cats over the age of 12 had evidence on radiographs of osteoarthritis. And so I think we're underdiagnosing the severity of osteoarthritis in cats. So really nice to see, um, especially comes in a low protein form, which is helpful for two diseases. And it was interesting because you would think, well, those are two separate diseases. But they talked a lot about muscle mass. So for example, if you have a cat or a dog with arthritis, are they gonna wanna walk around and to exercise? No, they're gonna be in pain. So if you're just sitting there or laying or sleeping all day long, you're gonna atrophy those muscles. So you think those are two separate diseases, but if we can control that degenerative joint disease, maybe they will be happier, they'll wanna eat more, they will move around more, they will maintain their muscle mass, and they'll just be happier patients. So these are all things that come together. So I'm gonna summarize what we learned today. And I think I'm gonna take away a couple of big points. The first point is trying to diagnose our kidney patients early, not relying on our BUN, our creatinine, or even an increased thirst in urination. Potentially consider other tools like the SDMA where you can in dogs up to a year and in cats maybe a year and a half before they're azotemic find out that they have evidence of kidney disease. We also learned about importance of diet. It's not only diet, for example, low protein diet to make sure we don't worsen their GFR. 
sodium restriction, phosphorus restriction, but it's also important to make sure that we have good palatability on our diets and we follow up with our pet owners to make sure that what we recommend they are using at home and the dog is enjoying. Because if not, as good of your recommendation is, it's not gonna be the right recommendation for that family. So if you guys did not attend today's live session and you wanna learn all of the tips, not just the summaries Justine and I gave you today, the recordings will be available for you and we will post a link. Tomorrow, just like today, we're gonna to give some new amazing live sessions and you can live stream with us. Just like you're sitting in the classroom, the big conference hall with us today in the Ritz Carlton, you can be there too, live on your couch. You can also watch it recorded later, but we hope to see you on the live stream. Justine and I will be back again after with another update for you guys, but we hope to see you on the live stream. We'll talk to you then. Keep on learning.